Council of Trent, 1545, 1563. Uh, it was such a big deal, it took 18 years to get it done. Uh, and I'll explain why that is in a moment in um, the course of the lecture. <clears throat> um, like I said, if you know anything about Trent, you probably know it as, again, the council that, you know, um, responds to um, the Protestant Reformation. Uh, and it is that. Um, as I said before, I'm going to sort of uh, emphasize probably its reform aspect more in this uh, in this lecture and put it in a, in a larger context for you, because it is part of a larger st story about the struggle to reform the church as a whole, but also especially maybe the hierarchy, the bishops, the cardinals, uh, the reform of the head, as reformers in the church said in the 15th century. Uh, one of their watchwords was uh, reform of the head and members. So I'll talk about this. And I'm going to talk, especially if you didn't watch my last lecture, uh, was about the Council of Constance. It was a previous, it was the council that ended the Great Western Schism when you had multiple popes. Uh, it brought that to the end. It was also intended to reform the church and it failed. <laughs> uh, as you're going to see, the Council of Trent is the unfortunately belated fulfillment of some of those hopes. So I'm going to start with talking about reform before Trent and why it didn't come off uh, until the 1540s. Uh, and reform after Basel just refers to uh, after the Council of Basel. Basel was the schismatic council, if you read my last lecture, which tried to assert the authority of popes, or, excuse me, of, of council, general councils over popes, which was um, a heresy called conciliarism. And the thing to note here is that this uh, idea, this conciliarist idea, haunts the church up through the 16th century. Uh, not just the idea itself. I mean, there aren't actually that many, it doesn't have that many proponents. It has a few, um, mostly in France, where they have a tradition, very strong tradition of uh, national uh, church independence, if you can put it that way, from the Pope. This is sometimes, this is another heresy, actually. It's called Gallicanism. Um, so there's some persistence there, especially at the University of Paris. The other universities around Europe as well still hold on to the idea. But more important than that, there is a persistent idea, especially in um, what we'd call today Germany, the Holy Roman Empire, um, that only a general council can really and truly reform, make reforms in the church. That it, it seems you need to have this council one way or the other, even if most people have more or less abandoned that conciliarist idea they have. Um, both of these things are still lurking in the background, which is why you get a couple of attempts to call councils without necessarily papal authority. One of which, the most hilarious of which in this period, is uh, the attempt by a Balkan archbishop, um, <laughs> who actually, he was actually someone who had worked in the Curia in Rome and for a variety of reasons been arrested and then expelled. And uh, out of sort of spite, he, he tried to reconvoke the Council of Basel that earlier reforming council, schismatic council in 1482. He literally went to the city of Basel in, in what is today Germany, uh, or I say Switzerland, and um, accused Pope Sixtus IV, who was the Pope at the time of heresy, simony, buying and selling church offices, and other quote unquote shameful vices. Um, needless to say, this didn't work. <laughs> uh, no bishops came, uh, monarchs of Europe ignored him. He was eventually arrested again. Uh, he actually, a uh, grim story, actually committed suicide while he was in prison, so uh, that didn't work out. More seriously, a more serious challenge came in the early 16th century um, when a group of cardinals um, wanting church reform and being still sort of toying with conciliarist ideas uh, announce a council to be held at the city of Pisa in northern Italy. If you remember that name, that name should sound familiar for my last lecture because prior to the Council of Constance in 1415, 1418 roughly, which ended the Western Schism earlier, there'd been another council, the Council of Pisa in 1409, which had sort of given birth to the conciliarist ideal. So they were harking back to this earlier tradition. And um, they claimed there was a state of emergency in the church because the church needed reform. And Julius II, the Pope in 1511, refused to call a council. So that was the justification. That along with, they actually claimed that he violated this, this Pope, the, uh, the canons of the Council of, of, or the decrees of the Council of Constance, which among them had been, you know, you need to call councils frequently. Um, in the event, they actually got, by the way, the approval, the public adhesion to the council of both the Holy Roman Emperor, uh, Maximilian I, he's an important figure, the emperors are important figures in this whole story, 
and Louis XII, the king of France, other big major kingdom in uh, Europe at that point. Um, but only about 30 bishops managed to actually attend this council, this, I guess you could pseudo council, if you want to put it that way. Uh, the emperor, in the end, refused to send anyone to it. And most of the rest of the bishops were actually from France. And the reason why is because in 14, uh, early 15th, uh, 16th century, um, France was at war with a league, of, a league of powers in Italy, including the papacy. The papal states was fighting with France. In other words, this was partly politically motivated, which is one of the reasons why it failed. The other reason why it failed is that uh, Pope Julius II undercut it by calling a council himself. Um, the Lateran Fifth Council, Lateran Five Council was called in 1512, um, which again, it's, it was also intended, by the way, to be a reforming council. And as we we'll get to in a moment, there was a reform program proposed at this council. In fact, by the way, because it's called by, uh, by a, a, a legitimate pope and everything, Lateran V is actually considered the 18th ecumenical council of the church. Uh, as it was, it enacted a few minor reforms and did very little else. Uh, it was a complete bust as far as actually uh, reforming the church, partly because Julius II died in 1513, partly because, of course, Julius probably had never had any real intention of making big grand reforms. And the reason why, uh, it, and by the way, the Lateran's in Rome, Lateran uh, Basilica there, but if you wonder where it's held at. The other reason, one of the reasons, one of the big tensions between this, one of the big reasons why immediately after the Reformation, that you don't have, immediately have a council, popes because of the, the earlier history of conciliarism and constants are very, very nervous about calling councils, very touchy about their authority. And so that's one of the reasons why one of the reasons why this fails um, to tell, come off before the Reformation hits. Nonetheless, you do have reform ideas circulating in Rome, um, despite the fact much of the opposition from actually reforming the church by a council is coming from Rome. Um, I mentioned a couple of these here. There were reform proposals, proposals drawn up in the pontificates of Nicholas V. Um, this goes back to the immediate era right after um, the Council of Basel in the 1440s and 50s. Um, the Curia knew they were under attack. The Papal Curia I, I, was the object of most people's reform proposals. Um, the Roman Curia was, uh, it was corrupt. Everybody kind of knew this. The Curia members themselves kind of knew their things were wrong, actually, um, for a long time. And so you have comprehensive for schemes for reforming their you know, curial uh, salaries, cure, uh, reforming um, selection of officials and stuff like this. Comes to nothing in most of these reigns. Uh, same thing with Pius II in the 1450s. He draws up a bull, papal bull, in the late uh, 14, six, in the end of his reign, the 1460s. That should be 1464, not 1462, uh, for reforms of the curial offices. But he died before it become law. This is a, a, a refrain, by the way. Either they die and before it becomes law, or they just sort of, you know, put it under the rug because they don't want to do it. Um, the one serious program for reform that was actually proposed, uh, or even more serious, probably the most comprehensive, was actually put up at Lateran Five. A couple of monks, of uh, uh, Kemaldi's monks, submitted a reform program to that council which called for, among other things, limiting uh, reforms for, you know, curial officials, their salaries, uh, making triennial, triennial visits of bishops to the curia so they can give an account of their administration, their diocese. Um, it proposed this reform program at Lateran Five that only those men who had read the entire Bible be admitted to holy orders. Uh, it even recommended a translation of the Bible into vernacular for the benefit of the laity. Uh, it called for a revision of canon law, uh, the mass uh, text, and the breviary. The breviary, if you know what that is, by the way, is the prayer book, essentially, of the priests, which they have to recite every day, to make them more uniform across the, the whole church. And finally, this reform program that was proposed at this dud of a council uh, actually called for the holding of frequent meetings of chapters and religious orders, and as well as diocesan synods, diocesan synods um, of clergy and the holding of general councils every five years. Um, besides this, you also had a Spanish program run up by Spanish bishops, the Lateran Five, which taken together uh, in some ways anticipates almost everything that'll get um, done at the Council of Trent. And I mention all this just to emphasize 
the ideas were already there many decades before the Council of Trent. It was just the institutional will that was lacking, unfortunately, to make that happen. And then finally, last thing to note about reform without councils, um, reform of the members, quote unquote, um, that, that tag phrase, the reform of the head of members um, that came from the 15th century, that meant reform of the head, the curia, and lesser extent, the hierarchy as a whole. Um, but members meant everybody else. And there was actually, an, I don't want to go into this too much detail, I don't have time for it, but there was plenty of reform, um, streams of reform going on, on the ground, as it were, um, in the church in the, the latter part of the 15th, early 16th century before the Reformation. Founding of new religious orders, founding of observant branches of uh, existing religious orders. There were some bishops who were doing good things. Um, I'll think of two off the top of my head. Cardinal um, Cisneros in Spain, sort of a model bishop in many ways. Um, St. John Fisher in England uh, was a humanist, uh, so was Cisneros actually, um, was a model bishop uh, in, he was also chancellor of, of, of Cambridge uh, University as well, but in his diocese in England. Um, you had people mush, pushing toward this. You've also had perform, uh, movements uh, alive among the laity, the founding of confraternities, things like the Brethren of the Common Life in, in the Netherlands later on, um, the Oratory of Divine Love, which is a lay organization. So you have all these things going on, but they're kind of disparate and they're not sort of united. That's why you needed a council to bring all this stuff together. And which again, too late, eventually, eventually that's what the Council of Trent will do. And so of course, the thing that of course we're getting at here, and I don't have time to go into too much, of course is the Reformation is what changes everything. <clears throat> and in fact, uh, the title of the section of the lecture, A Council, A Council is actually, um, <laughs> If you um, um, remember the Diet of Worms, which is where the Imperial Assembly, the German, the Holy Roman Empire, its um, uh, assembly of its estates, condemns uh, Luther in 1521. The papal legate at that uh, meeting uh, wrote a letter back to Rome that everywhere he went in Worms, there was a, the same refrain, a council, a council. Everyone was desperate for something to reform the church. And so we'll see what they did and why they didn't do it immediately, which there's basically a couple of big reasons. But first thing to note about all this is that one of the reasons why the Reformation came off as it did was because of a desire for a council in Germany. Luther, of course, posts his 95 Theses in 1517. They get published. He becomes sort of a celebrity in Germany because he's he seems to be promoting reform. Um, and um, he gets called in by Rome. He call, he's called in to actually meet Cardinal Cajetan, who's a theologian, curial official. Um, when Luther refuses to recant his uh, uh, his beliefs at that point, um, uh, Cajetan basically uh, um, asks the the, uh, the Holy Roman Emperor to send him to Rome so he can be tried for heresy. At this point, Martin Luther makes what is essentially a legal maneuver. He appeals to a future council. Now, if you remember back far enough, this has already been condemned, by the way, by a couple of different popes. It should have settled the question they condemned it, but it didn't. All the, the problems of the previous 150 years of the schism and everything else had maybe made people not quite sure about papal authority. They expected that it needed to be a papally approved council, but a council could decide questions like this. And so he appealed to it. And there was, by the way, a real still expectation among not just uh, laity and lower clergy, but among bishops in Germany, in the Holy Roman Empire. Um, such that this is one of the reasons why he manages to survive and, and not be condemned. Um, and in fact, by 1520, when things have shifted, because it, by 1520, he's clearly made a break with Rome, with its teachings. Um, he's still appealing to councils, but at this point, it's very tactical. In fact, in 1519, he's already in a public de debate with a uh, um, man named Johannes Act at Leipzig, he's already basically decreed by that point he doesn't he does not uh, some, he does not uh, believe in the authority of councils anymore. By this point, he's already proclaimed his idea of sola scriptura, in other words, and yet he still appeals to that. Why? I'll get to this in a moment because people in Germany are expecting that uh, he's portraying himself as being a, a great reformer who's trying who's trying to do things the conciliar way, as it were. Uh, and not somebody has, who, is, who is, you know, making a break with the church. Uh, in fact, he, when he's condemned, uh, finally, Leo X condemns him in 1520 with his bull, Exerge Domine, it explicitly condemns, appeals to a council. Um, does it work? 
uh, doesn't work partly because Rome doesn't understand on the ground in terms of public opinion, things have already gotten beyond this to a certain degree. Luther that same year publishes his letter to the nobility of Germany. It's one of his three major reformation tracks. He does sort of spell out more clearly um, his break with those teachings. And yet he's still, by the way, hinting that he'll accept a, a council's decision. He really won't at this point, but um, his letter to the German nobility, nobility of Germany is essentially, because he, if you read it, he attacks the Pope, but he's also appealing to the princes of Germany. He's appealing to the emperor as well. And he's doing that because, uh, quite frankly, you know, things like church reform are matters for the emperor and these people in the Middle Ages. Um, and he's trying to appeal to their national sentiment, by the way, because at this point, he's portrayed himself as the, you know, the upright, honest German reformer, um, you know, um, being uh, persecuted by the corrupt, you know, foreign Italian curia, by the way. Um, and uh, people, generally speaking, outside of sort of theological circles, don't understand at this point um, the import of Luther's um, Luther's um, theological decisions, most people. They think he's just a reformer. Um, and so by the time he's excommunicated in 1521, again, he's basically turned, at this point, he's actually gotten um, some of the princes of Germany on his side. He's excommunicated. Um, and of course, he's condemned to the Diet of Worms in 1521. Problem is, of course, you need the estates of the empire to, uh, to carry this out. And he's a subject of people, princes, who are now protect, Frederick of Saxony is the guy who protects him. Um, and even if the, the whole Roman emperor, a man named Charles V in 1521, wanted to do this, he can't quite do it either without the, without the consensus of these other princes. If you don't know, the whole Roman empire is kind of an elective monarchy. And so it's not, it's not like France where, you know, the king is, you know, supreme. The, Charles V has to sort of negotiate with these people. Um, and this leads to the problem because uh, people aren't quite trusting of the Pope's authority at this point because of all the corruption. So it turns to, um, turns to the emperor to try to do something about this. There are multiple attempts of the emperors to try to do something about this. Throughout the 1520s, even in the 1530s, in particular, um, the Imperial Diet, the uh, uh, Diet, the Assembly meets multiple times to try to do something about this. Um, Almost immediately, they come to a problem uh, in 1522, died of Nuremberg. The German estates uh, call, and they call this for this constantly, a quote, a free Christian council in German lands, unquote. What do they mean by free? What do they mean, why, and why in German lands? They won't meet in Italy. Won't have anything to do with the Pope. Uh, in particular, most of the princes, even at this early period, who sympathize with Luther, they reject. Uh, what they mean by a free council means without the Pope, basically. They have, at this point, they're already uh, so distrustful of papal authority. They think, by the way, this is, a, this is one of the reasons why um, the council doesn't occur, um, that the Pope won't really allow a uh, real criticism of the Curia and the papacy to go on. And in fact, the second diet in 1524 winds up calling for a national council of German bishops, which at this point, uh, Charles V steps in and says no. And so that's off the table. Uh, by the time you get to the late 1520s, things have already pretty much solidified to where the break is probably already permanent. People don't know that quite yet for reasons on the ground. Uh, but there's still many attempts. Charles V is a fairly conscientious uh, man. He really does. He needs Protestant help, actually, as you'll see in a moment. Um, partly because one of the things that uh, is slowing this down, process down, besides, um, well, the big problem, of course, is papal fears of calling a council, right? That's a big thing. Um, they, they're they worried about what will happen if they call a council, which allows people to criticize the Pope without, you know, um, restraint. Um, the diets of Speyer meet, uh, well, I'll say all these diets actually in the 1520s meet dur during wartime. France is at war with the empire, so that causes problems. Um, in addition to that, the emperor in 1526 is fighting with the Ottoman Empire, which is invades and, and conquers Hungary in 1526. In 1529, uh, the, um, the Ottomans are at the gates of Vienna. So he's distracted by this. It also means, by the way, he can't impose a settlement on those princes because he needs their help, he needs their revenue to fight, his tax revenue to fight those wars. Um, and in fact, 1529, by the way, is kind of a, a turning point because at this point, the Lutheran sympathizing princes of Germany, 
uh, this is where they, after the, another unsuccessful attempt to sort of reconcile theological positions, issue a protest to the imperial diet, which is where the term Protestant comes from, uh, that 1529 meaning of the Diet of Speyer. Uh, in fact, initially refers to, by the way, just Protestants in Germany, but spreads elsewhere. Um, a couple more attempts are made. The most important ones are the Diet of Augsburg. You've probably heard of the Confession of Augsburg. That's, if you may have, that's, that was Charles V's attempt, um, noble though it was, though pointless, to ask the uh, Lutheran princes of Germany and their theologians to present a, a doctrine of, a statement of faith that they could sort of, you know, negotiate Turns out at that no point, nobody really wanted to negotiate anymore. Um, and um, it led to that coming in the, the basis of the confession for the Lutheran, Lutheran church in Germany, but no agreement. Last major attempts made in 1541, this time not an imperial diet, but a so-called well, colloquy uh, at the city of Regensburg. Again, no agreement. It basically fails um, to do all these sorts of things. Again, why no council at this point? Um, why none earlier? It is because the popes at the time, uh, particularly we'll get to them uh, in a moment, um, uh, the ones who were, during, uh, who were uh, uh, reigning during the council itself, but um, the papacy again was nervous about all of this, uh, was nervous about any council it didn't have control over. And yet, even despite all this, um, by the 1530s it was so obvious and it was, quite frankly, too late by then to prevent the Reformation from happening. It was obvious it was necessary. Um, you did have attempt to call one in 1537. Paul III, who was the Pope at the time, um, calls one to meet at Mantua, in northern Italy. Um, it doesn't work, partly because um, um, the outbreak, there's another outbreak of war between France and the Empire, which kind of scuttles things. Also because Paul III is nervous about it. He wants to control it. And so attendance is very low. Uh, Protestant princes of Germany are invited. They refuse to attend. Uh, and so it's, a uh, it's moved, reconvoked to Vicenza um, um, in Venetian territory and then scuttled altogether, adjourned two years later. Despite all this, Paul III was in some ways serious about reform. Um, and in fact, uh, he tries to initiate uh, a, a Curia, a, a program to reform the Curia in the 1530s. 1536, he puts together a committee of cardinals and other officials to study ways to reform the Curia. Uh, and the reason why, by the way, is okay, if they're afraid of the council, they're also afraid of what will happen if they don't reform themselves. Uh, as one cardinal put it, quote, unless we make haste to reform ourselves spontaneously, reform will be forced upon us, unquote. And what happens is he puts a bunch of uh, two groups of cardinals basically on this committee, one of whom is a group of reformers, people who are, um, um, they are really are dead set on reforming the Curia and reforming the church. Um, he also puts on a group of uh, 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 cardinals who are members of the Curia, who are more, I'm using this term lightly and not in any specific sense, more conservative. They also favor reform. Um, they don't want to create a lot of new institutions or new laws to reform uh, corruption in the papacy. Why? Their idea is to go back to um, the laws already in the books, you know, from the Middle Ages, from the papal decretals of the Middle Ages, uh, and enforce those laws. I think you don't need to do that. The point is they're both actually open to reform. One's much more hesitant about it than the other. I mention this because the ideas they put forth there are pretty, um, they're pretty, well, they produce a document this committee does. Uh, it's called the Concilium Emendanda Ecclesia. It's basically a memorandum of, of proposal for reforms, which is really, um, well, it basically accuses, <laughs> it basically says the corruption of the Pope and his uh, officials are the cause of all these problems. It's very direct, it's a very brutal attack actually on the Curia. Um, and as you can kind of tell, it didn't work <laughs> because those more conservative members convinced Paul III he shouldn't undertake. And it was a fairly radical program. However, however, Paul was not totally, um, uh, totally averse to this. And he did two things, by the way, that uh, will bear fruit for the future. One is that all the these I mentioned these reforming officials, cardinals, bishops, he raises um, something like a dozen or so of these men to the cardinalate. People like uh, the Venetian Gasparo Contarini, who will be present at the beginning of the council, 
Uh, Reginald Pole was an exile from uh, England at this point. Remember the Reformation started, started in England in the 1530s. Uh, he'll be a notable reformer. Uh, a man named Morone, who's a papal diplomat. All these people play a big role in the latter part of the Council of Trent. And they're people who will be determined to actually enact some reforms. So I mentioned that even though he doesn't reform structures, when you're talking about I don't want to talk about the, the Catholic Church as something like a merely human institution, but it is a human institution. And in any human institution, I hate to use cliches, but when they're true, you have to use them. Personnel as policy. It was very important. He injected some new blood in the, into the uh, College of Cardinals. will bear fruit. The other thing Paul III does is that he does welcome the reform of the members, quote unquote, new religious orders in Rome. And uh, the most important thing maybe that he does actually is in 1540, if you know where I'm going with this, is he gives official papal approval to the Society of Jesus that had been founded by St. Ignatius for Um, And that, as much as anything, of course, if you're talking about the Counter-Reformation, that's probably where that starts. So he does open the door a little bit, even though he's really not a harder reformer. And yet, by 1542, he's ready to try again to call it on the council. Again, he attempts to open it at Trent in 1542. Again, it's dashed by another round of warfare between the French king, this time Francis I, and Charles V. Um, and so he's forced to postpone it until 14, 1543. 1544, peace breaks out with between France and the empire. And finally, finally, because um, the French king gives his blessing to it, agrees to send representatives, he doesn't send many, but he does send some. Um, the way was open, and um, Paul III issues a bull, Letare Jerusalem, Rejoice Jerusalem, uh, for the council to open on Letare Sunday, March 15th, 1545. And finally, nearly 30 years after the Reformation starts, the council does begin. And so that's, that's the next part about the council itself. Rejoice Jerusalem, Council of Trent, 1545 to 1543. Um, just to give you some background of what's going on, I'm mentioning all this stuff I know, but the political aspect of this is very important to note. This is what uh, Europe's going to look like by 1555, religiously speaking, 10 years into Trent and its sitting. As you can see, by that point, by the middle of the 16th century, um, the blue, by the way, is all the uh, Calvinist or Reformed areas. The yellow are uh, Lutheran. <laughs> mixed with, in with the Catholic and the pink, and also with other things here. The empire is very mixed. In other words, the empire has, um, um, you know, religious pluralism, which nobody wants in the 16th century, obviously. Um, it also, you can see the little dots here. These are the, um, the spread of, of, of Calvinism in France by the 1550s. And of course, the Church of England has its own little unique thing as well. Uh, but right down here in northern Italy is the city of Trent. And they meet there in the city of Trent uh, because it is technically, um, it's in Italy, but technically it is actually within the bounds of the Holy Roman Empire. Again, they wouldn't meet with princes, with the princes of, with delegates from Germany in Italian territory. I can't stress, um, even among, even among people who were um, convinced Catholics and were against the Protestants, still had a lot of, there was a lot of tension at the council, in other words, between delegates from other places and papal legates, because they were afraid the Pope was going to shut them down if they proposed reforms that were too radical. And just to go over for a few minutes, the, the, these are the popes who were, um, you know, reigning during the, the period of the council. Uh, Paul III, Julius III, Marcellus II, very briefly, uh, Paul IV, and then Paul the Pius IV. I'll reference those as I go forward. I want you to have that so you can see it. There's five popes sitting while the council is uh, in session. And the first thing to note about this is that Rome did try to <laughs> uh, control certain things about the nature of the, of the, uh, of the council. Um, I, I say constitution, I don't mean that literally, but how the council operated was very intentional. Um, uh, at the council, they would have um, congregations where they would discuss, you know, certain things. Congregations just meetings of all the prelates and clergy, even those who weren't voting members in terms of the actual decrees that they eventually passed. The only people who would actually vote on these actually decrees were bishops and heads of religious orders uh, as individuals. And I mention that because, again, standing behind all this is what happened in the 15th century with the Council of Constance. Again, yeah, remember my lecture, which you should have should have listened to. Uh, Constance was sort of like an attempt to. Uh, change how these councils were operated. Remember, people voted not by individual 
bishops, but by blocks of national blocks of clergy, right? The entire clergy as a body from France and Spain, a lot of stuff would vote as a, a whole in, that, in the Council of Constance. The papacy wanted to shut that down immediately, and they did. Uh, they got that uh, instituted initially um, so they could repudiate that idea. Um, they also, one thing they did is that they set up, um, and this is one of the things, one of the reasons why I think Trent succeeds, is they, they again, unless you think, I think they don't, they didn't really think at this point they were going to, they were trying to, um, trying to make out, uh, you'll see, they try to make some overtures to Protestants at this point. I don't think they had much hope for it. They really had two main goals. One was to clarify and reaffirm Catholic doctrine. And the other was to, again, finally try to reform the church, is its head, the curia, the, um, the bishops. Uh, and so they agreed on, basically at the beginning, that in every session they would pass two, uh, two decrees, one on dogma, another on reform, um, practical reform, which they do. And so they have very, a very clear set of goals uh, when they're going into this. Uh, and they begin, and uh, in the after the first few sessions, they don't start actually passing decrees. The fourth one, um, they start out going to the heart of the conflict with um, with uh, the reformers. Um, the first um, um, uh, dogmatic decree passed has to do with um, scripture and tradition, um, because of course the, the you know one of the bases of authority, according to Luther and his followers and the reformed is that scripture alone, of course, is an authority. And of course, everything, virtually every dogmatic decree in Trent basically defines this as the opposite. It says, no, there are two sources of revelation, scripture and sacred tradition. So you have that on there. Uh, next session, fifth session uh, in uh, 1547, um, you have uh, um, decrees on original sin, which again, we'll get to, they'll get to in a moment, the bigger ones on justification. Um, but reaffirming the doctrine of original sin, uh, even at the same time, by the way, they re reaffirm the original goodness, actually, of human nature. So, again, no total depravity if you're talking about Calvinism or anything like that. At the same time, they pass a clerical reform, uh, trying to encourage preaching, uh, clerical preaching, to improve, um, you know, homiletics, if you use that term. Um, they pass a decree basically establishing uh, enjoining cathedrals, for example, to establish lectureships on the Bible. So clergy will be a little more well-trained. This is the first step toward training clergy, which they know, especially in rural areas, are not very well-educated. And so this is the first step toward that. Unfortunately, once again, <laughs> war breaks in to sort of just begin to disrupt the council. Uh, actually, it's part of the part of the process here, but the small Caldic war which is a war, a small call, the League of Small Call, I think I pronounced that correct. I think I, wrote, uh, I, think I uh, may have misspelled that, but um, the Small Caldic League was a League of Protestant Princes. They began to clash with Charles V in Germany in 1546. Even while this is going on, in the sixth, second, sixth session, they do pass, uh, while the war is going on, um, the decree on justification. And of course, this is the big thing. This is the big you know, this is the doctrine which uh, Luther said uh, the entire Reformation uh, stood or, fall, fell, uh, or fell on. And so they reaffirmed in, uh, in that decree the, the definition of justification going back to the, you know, uh, the Council of Orange in 529, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that justification was not by faith alone. It was by faith um, uh, plus good works being inspired by grace. The idea being grace begins the process by which we can have some free will in order to sort of contribute to our salvation that way without proclaiming it to be achieved by us. Uh, and so it uh, does that, that's one of the big ones. It also tries to address in uh, the sixth session a major, major problem with, um, with uh, the hierarchy, which I'm saying, I'm putting as absenteeism, uh, the non-residence of bishops. Bishops had a, a, a habit of collecting different bishoprics uh, and not residing uh, in them. Why would they do this? Because you get the, the bishopric, you get the you get the revenues that come from it, taxation, tithes, stuff like that, and you become really rich. Uh, and so they pass a decree which is not all that strongly worded. It's kind of watered down. It doesn't. It's not as strong as some of the language that we put later in the uh, the uh, council, but it's the first start for trying to do that. 
And then finally, in the last session before this clo gets closed down in 1547, they pass a decree enumerating the numbers of sacraments, seven sacraments, not two, as the reformers say. And they begin to try to address the problem of benefices. Benefices refers to um, church property or church livings that go along with offices and people buying and selling them, people trying to use them for their own financial gain. However, everything gets interrupted in 1547, in March of that year, when um, a typhus breaks out in Trent. And Paul III decides to transfer, uh, tries to transfer the council to Bologna, which causes a problem. Um, the problem is that he has agreed, made an agreement with the emperor, Charles V, that it will meet in Trent, not in Italy, outside of the empire. This is a big no-no. Because um, there are already, even before this, serious tensions between um, the uh, not just the legate, the people, not just uh, delegates from the empire, but other places between them and the papal legates. Uh, again, there's a real fear that they're going to get shut down by the pope if they say something again too, you know, too uh, risque. Um, Charles V, after his victory in 1547 against the Protestants, it seems that seems to have things in hand. He demands that Paul, uh, Paul III bring the council back to Trent. He refuses. Again, Paul III is, again, eh, nervous about all this. Um, nervous, by the way, very suspicious at certain times of the emperor's power. And he, it, but, and he does not uh, bring it back to Trent. Instead, he suspends it. And where that will remain there for the next four years. In fact, after he actually dies uh, in 15, uh, 1549. The sort of second act of this uh, council begins a few years later when finally his successor, Julius III, uh, manages to recall the council and it meets again for a, basically a year in 1551, 1552. Um, and again, tensions are high uh, at one point during the debates because they're debating, um, they debate the Episcopate a lot. The nature of bishops is a big boiling point, especially um, the rights of bishops and their authority vis-a-vis -vis the papacy, which I'll come to again in a moment. At one point during one of these debates, uh, a papal legate actually rebuked a bishop so harshly that two of his colleagues uh, complained that, quote, is this a, still a free council? So my point, is, I'm pointing this out to you, by the way, because I want to stress there's lots of tensions in this council. Uh, it wasn't uh, pre foreordained that it was going to succeed. Uh, and yet they do, in 13th session, I'll show you the, the outline a little bit, what they did. They still pass more degrees, dogmatic degrees. And by the way, if you're getting from what I've said already, most of the debates on actual dogmas were fairly, um, they were fairly, um, my brain just died. They were, there was not that much conflict. There was mostly a lot of agreement on that. The real, the real uh, conflict came on reforms. Um, in the 14th century, again, they pass on penance. Again, penance is an idea that Protestants reject, as well as extreme unction. Um, but in 1551 and 52, they also make the only attempt to, um, to uh, invite um, Protestant delegates to come to the council. They arrive there. As soon as they get there, they demand basically that the, that essentially that they make the demand that they always do, which is that it should basically, the council should in effect, renounce the papal authority. It needs to be free of that. It's never going to work. Um, even though they do, they they try this in good faith. I think both of them did. It just was not going to work at that point. Um, and then again, 1552, uh, war flares up in Germany. Uh, the small Caldic League comes to blows with Charles V. And if you're wondering, by the way, that war is happening in the empire, trends in the empire. That's why they suspend it in 1552. This will lead in, uh, uh, in, uh, into an unexpected interregnum, not unexpected, um, because um, for the next 10 years, the council, it seems like the council may be even dead. There's actually a dispute, uh, we'll get to in a moment, whether or not it, it, they need to convoke a new one, because it basically goes into abeyance. Um, and in fact, as you're gonna see, this is kind of providential for a variety of reasons that it did happen this way, but it does. Um, um, because you're going to have, uh, as the bishops go back to the diocese in 1552, they're going to have some bishops try to implement some of these decrees in their own diocese, but without the authority of a council, nothing comes of it. 
people reject it. Um, Julius III, before he dies in 1555, um, tries to issue a bull that will actually enjoin the, the, the uh, reforms that have already passed and the decrees, um, but he dies before he can promulgate it. <laughs> I said that happens a lot, it does. Um, more to the point, you have another another pope get um, who uh, gets elected in his stead in 1555, Marcellus II, who, um, just as an aside, by the way, if you've ever heard the uh, the mass setting by um, by Giovanni um, Palestrina, the uh, uh, his Misa Papa Marcelli, that's the mass setting that he did for that pope. Anyway, only, only reigned a, a few months. He dies, and in 1555, um, Paul IV. Um, by the name Carafa, Cardinal Carafa, who had actually been a reformer under Paul III. He had been on that committee uh, I mentioned earlier that proposed reforms that got shot down. He becomes Pope in 1555. And um, he is someone who at this point thought the council was a terrible mistake. And he is dead set on never calling it again. And in fact, he actually um, tries to undercut Trent by calling, uh, by uh, um, organizing a Roman synod uh, of bishops in 1556 to prepare for another Lateran council. So it's ironic, Paul IV, a, a former reformer, basically gets to be Pope and says no. Um, and in fact, it's left to his successor, uh, Paul the, uh, uh, Pius IV, who eventually does in 1560 reconvoke the council. And they actually spend some time at the beginning of in, in, uh, this last session, this last uh, period, deciding, hey, is this actually a reconvening of the council? So the, they said it was a reconvening of the, other, uh, the same council, so I recount it that way. But this is going to be a turning point. This is the sort of turning point of things, because not because Pius IV is much more on board with the council, because things have changed in 10 years. Um, Historians sometimes talk about the new council, uh, talk about this se session almost being a new council. Why? Because by the time you get to 1562, when it finally meets again, a lot of the older cardinals have died. A lot of those new cardinals, remember the ones I said appointed by Paul III, who are reformers, are now in the College of Cardinals and at the council. Um, and in fact, when you get to the council, I mentioned this before, you only had in 1545 when it first met about 40 or so bishops. It was lightly attended. More came after that. At the beginning uh, of um, uh, 1562, 113 bishops are there. Um, by the end of it, almost 200 will have uh, come to the council. It's much more highly attended. Um, and in fact, the most important work the council does really does uh, happen here in many ways. Um, and so it's kind of providential that it didn't meet for 10 years in some ways. And in fact, they almost immediately get into a crisis, um, serious, serious debate um, over again, the issue of Episcopal reform. Um, you can almost see what happened earlier under Paul III and the Curia were playing itself out here. You have, uh, again, those reformers who are demanding, they do something about the Curia, do something about the bishops. Um, coming again up against more conservative, I should say, they're still reformers, but more hesitant bishops at this council. And one of the big things that they actually debate and don't quite decide on, by the way, is the nature, nature of a bishop's authority. You may think, that, by the way, this hasn't been formally defined. It hasn't, not in you know, strict terms. Um, in particular, um, the reformers wanted um, the uh, bishop of authority, bishop's authority to be defined as what they call jus divinum, basically by divine right. Why is this important? What that means to say is they want to say that the bishop has rights that the pope can't overrule. In other words, this is in some ways meant as a way to embolden bishops so they can, by the way, be good pastors in their diocese. But it comes at, or at least people that oppose this, it think it come, might come at the expense of the papacy. So this is a big row over this. Um, because the implication, of course, is this might be a threat to papal authority. Uh, and in fact, when they issued a decree on holy orders, uh, I don't have the, the, the session up there, I'll show you in a moment where it comes in. Um, they will talk about the, the bishops being in place of the apostles, being their successors. They don't actually put that phrase in there. And in fact, it'll be left to, uh, they're meant to do it at Vatican I many, uh, in, in 1870. It's only only at Vatican II where they actually do that. Is that contentious? 
but some of the biggest reforms come in the last few sessions, because 23, 24, and 5 are the last sessions of Trent. Um, session 23, among other things, I'll show you the, the, the map of all this in a second. They do a lot of things in this council over 18 years. Um, they call for the creation of educational institutions, seminaries, as they come to be known, for the education of clergy. You would have thought, by the way, this would be a, a no-brainer, but, uh, and again, people have been calling for better education of the clergy for a while, but, um, you know, I once had a, <laughs> I once had a, a friend of mine who was a, a clerk for a judge in Kansas, um, tell me that, uh, you know, if, if it had a modern seminary system, uh, Martin Luther would never have gotten in. <laughs> if you don't remember, by the way, how Martin Luther became a priest, he got caught in a rainstorm one day and made a vow to St. Anne that he could live through it because he was so terrified of the thunder and lightning that he'd become a priest. <laughs> you know, they wouldn't let you in a seminary. They wouldn't let you in the priesthood a day if you tried that. But they finally do, belatedly, uh, call for the creation of uh, training centers for priests. Big deal. Uh, and finally, maybe the most important of the degrees, they finally passed in the last two sessions, reform regarding the bishops. Um, they finally wor uh, work out a compromise between the reformers and the uh, more conservative bishops there, whereby the council enjoins that the bishops be resident in their diocese, that they no longer hold multiple, multiple uh, bishoprics, multiple benefices, um, that they undertake visitations of their clergy uh, every year to see if they're doing their jobs, doing their, working out their calling, as it were. Um, at the same time, they strengthen the authority of bishops in their own diocese. This is something I haven't mentioned before. Uh, one of the complaints bishops had against Rome was that they couldn't run their diocese in a pastoral way, if you want to use that term, um, because they could be undercut. Because of, why? Because lower clergy, or, or more particularly, the biggest problem was um, religious orders, could appeal to Rome over their heads, uh, and this undercut their authority. So the uh, the council basically uh, basically ends that. So they basically have a lot more control over what goes on in the diocese, so they can do this, among other things. And so by 1563, the work of the council is more or less finished. One last thing to note about this: um, the uh, president of the council in the last uh, phase here, the 1560s. Um, uh, in fact, it was his program, by the way, that gets more or less makes up those, that Episcopal reform, excuse me. And when I say relig religious reform, by the way, in that on the, uh, the slide there, I mean reform of the religious orders. That also is, takes place uh, in those sessions. Um, Morone, um, uh, by the end of the council, Pius IV is, is getting sick. Uh, he actually will die in another year or so. And um, Again, there's some because the council had to be reconvoked after 10 years. There were some, there were some, you know, um, um, question about okay, is this actually, uh, are these decrees actually a, a real council? Um, they are confirmed all the decrees individually. He made sure that Paul the, uh, uh, Pius the Fourth before he died reconfirmed every single decree. And why am I mentioning that? Again, if you remember my last lecture, <laughs> I'm referring back to the Council of Constance a lot in this because it was haunting people up until the end of Trent. Trent basically exercises Constance in its problems, if you want to put it that way, to a certain degree. Um, the end of the Council of Constance was very ambiguous because they weren't sure, were those decrees that were kind of controversial, did they get confirmed by a pope or no? Uh, Morone, who was the uh, papal legate, the papal, uh, the president of, the, of the, uh, this last session, made sure he went to the pope, got them reconfirmed, and became part, of course, church law and church teaching. Um, and the council ends its work finally after 18 years on December 4th, 1563. And thus ends, in fait accompli, accomplished comes accomplished fact, um, the Council of Trent in, uh, in uh, 1563. A couple of charts for you just to show you. Um, so you can kind of see just how much, <laughs> how much they did over 18 years. Um, they were working, I'll put them that, but you have all the decrees basically. Some I haven't mentioned. Uh, they did one, I mentioned sacraments. They also passed one for every individual sacrament, a decree, dogmatic decrees. Um, <clears throat> I don't want to spend too much time on this. I want you guys to ask questions, but um, um, decrees, again, pretty much everything reaffirms something that the reformers denied and clarifies it to a degree. Uh, to a degree, they don't do 
uh, one of the things I think the reason why Trent succeeds is they they give themselves limited goals they can actually achieve. It doesn't say everything to be said about these topics. It just says what it needs to say in its documents. Uh, but everything was disputed. Purgatory, veneration of uh, um, cult of the saints, that should be cults, cult of the saints actually, um, veneration of relics, uh, veneration of images, all are basically reconfirmed at the council uh, as you get toward the end. Um, um, one of the more, um, it, uh, in terms of marriage, it reconfirms the uh, indissolubility of marriage, those sorts of things. Um, so that is part of the decrees. And these are listed the reform decrees. Um, uh, and again, I mentioned all the stuff, and this is something, <coughs> uh, uh, again, I, I sort of highlight with the, the, uh, uh, the ones that are probably the most important in terms of reforming the head, right? Again, they don't actually reform the curia, although things will change in Rome because of personnel changes. Um, they definitely reform the hierarchy in a way that, uh, a way that people have been calling for for a long, long time. And you can kind of see again uh, just how much they accomplished over that period. And so, tried to intervene reform. A few last um, just to, uh, um, reflections on this. <clears throat> what did the council achieve? Well, first and foremost, of course, in the face of, and this is the sense it is a counter reformation council, uh, it clarifies and reaffirms Catholic doctrine. Um, virtually everything the Protestants deny, they, they reaffirm. Um, they don't always explain these things in, in detail. They just basically reaffirm, yeah, these things are are are, um, are part of Catholic teaching. Uh, very very important, by the way, um, because well, again, one of the reasons why um, the Reformation became um, 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 why the separation happened with the, the Lutherans later on in, in Germany was you had people at a local level who just didn't understand the import of what was going on, probably because they didn't understand the faith that well. So it was important to do that. Um, again, this council, sometimes you have, you know, people want to criticize Trent for being, you know, it doesn't, it didn't do enough for, well, uh, for unity, but unity was already lost by the time it met, unfortunately. Um, the council was meant to strengthen the existing people who were still Catholic, and it did um, by giving them that clarification of what they were supposed to believe. Uh, it achieved a successful, even if incomplete, reform of the hierarchy. It didn't do everything, as you kind of see. It didn't quite get definition of bishop's authority. It didn't touch the curia um, uh, directly. It did touch it actually, um, but again, the 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 council fathers were wise. They knew they couldn't get everything they wanted done. They focused on what they could do. Uh, at the very end of the council, uh, the cardinal Morone, who I mentioned earlier, um, base, uh, uh, was co uh, quoted as saying that uh, we are men and not angels, meaning they couldn't get everything they done, they got what was realistic to get done. And I can't stress how important the reform of the hierarchy was. Um, I, I've referred to this stuff more and more in my lectures lately, but you can kind of see all the problems that have uh, occurred in the Catholic Church over the last half century. The McCarrick Court just came out, just how much, just how devastating it is when uh, the head uh, is, um, is corrupt. Uh, and so, you know, and that reform, by the way, is, you know, some of it happened before the council, obviously, but um, uh, hugely important, hugely important um, for uh, um, uh, the future of Catholicism, for strengthening it um, uh, going forward, which it does. Um, uh, again, the establishment of a selection process for candidates for, for uh, bishops, for cardinals. Uh, again, those things are of lesser importance, but still important they did those things. And then finally, the successful implementation of this, which is kind of lies outside the scope of my lecture because it's such a, it's almost a separate topic. <laughs> um, the um, the uh, um, um, the council directed um, directed um, the papacy to in implement a lot of what they what they uh, uh, dictated. For example, things like um, the liturgy, for example, that was not done by the council. They did actually enjoy some reforms, but that was left to the papacy to implement, which it did. Pius V, the successor to uh, Pius IV, issues the, what we think of as the, um, the Pian Missal, uh, a revision of the Roman Rite, basically, in its mass text. A revision of the Roman Breviary is also done on the authority of the council. Um, almost immediately, you have uh, bishops who are, 
uh, fired by the ideal of the council, um, taking the stuff back to the diocese, most famously St. Charles Borromeo, who was the nephew of Pius IV um, in Milan, becomes the sort of model for uh, a bishop who is a pastoral, who wants to meet with his clergy, who wants to help the flock grow in faith. And again, uh, and I should mention, by the way, this doesn't happen overnight. Um, it doesn't happen, and it actually, it's a separate story because like the council itself, this is one of the things I wanted to emphasize in my lecture, you see what it took to actually accomplish this. Uh, all the strife, all the failures, all that other stuff. It was more successful in the implementation, but it still probably stood better than probably half a century. Uh, a lot of places that uh, decrees of Trent were resisted, France, naturally. Uh, even in the empire, it took a while, probably not until the early 16, 16 teens, maybe late 16 teens, but even the 30 years war, is it really reaching those places? Uh, other places like Spain, Italy, it comes more quickly. Um, but it uh, it provides for the mechanisms and it has people who are willing to do it uh, in places where they can do it, places of authority. And which is why it is probably, and this is the last thing I'll mention before I uh, get to, to your guys' questions. We think of this, I remember I haven't talked about, you know, I haven't talked about the Counter-Reformation or sometimes we talk about the Catholic Reformation in, um, you know, in, in this period. Probably because the council is not really, it doesn't actually start either of those things. It's not, it's not the source of, um, you know, countering Protestantism. You already had that starting before that with, you know, reformed orders like the, the Jesuits. It's not the source of Catholic reform. Catholic reform has been going on for a while. What the council does is bring all that together and give it a focus. Um, it makes it uniform, like, you know, making the liturgy more uniform across, uh, across the, uh, across, um, the whole church. Um, it gives uh, it gives direction and impetus to reforms that are already in place. And it and this is the last thing, I, I said this is the last thing. I'm, I'm still mentioning things here, but um, as the historian Carlos Ear, great historian up at uh, Harvard, mentioned, it basically creates a uniform church, which in fact the reform itself is actually global in reach because these decrees will go to Latin America, they'll go to Africa, Congo, they'll make it all the way to India. Uh, it'll create a global, the church as a global institution, really, in some ways, uh, and, and turn it and, and present the uh, face that it does for the next several centuries on the basis of this. So um, if the Council of Constance was a mess and kind of in some ways a depressing story, I think you can f safely feel whatever its uh, problems are. Um, uh, Council of Trent, something uh, you can see as a success and something as part of uh, a successful effort, probably the most successful reform council in the history of the Catholic Church.